This is the Ross Developers Podcast, episode 127. The Ross Developers Podcast, the Ross Developers. The Ross Developers Podcast, the Ross Developers. Bam, bow, bow. Hello, Ross Developers, and welcome to the Ross Developers Podcast, the program, the podcast that gives you insights from the experts about how to program your robots with Ross. This is Ricardo from The Construct, and today we would like to dedicate this episode to the people that are still working on autonomous driving. You know, so it looks like uh, the, the, the fame for working on autonomous driving cars and also this fashion for that has been forgotten for in a little bit. And then we th still think that that's going to be a technology of the future and there is a lot of jobs there, interesting jobs and super, super exciting. And yeah, so we want to push and then we want to promote, we want to support these guys that are still working on this uh, subject. So if that's your case, this episode is dedicated to you. Excellent. Then what are we going to talk today? Probably you have read uh, already the title of the podcast. Oh, yeah. So it's about autonomous driving. Yes. So we are going to learn more about this subject in a minute. But before going into that, let me tell you about our robotics developers masterclass program that we have developed at the construct where we are teaching uh, students from almost a zero background to become robotics developers in only six months. So it's a very condensed program. And we have finished the batch number two, so it's fully enrolled and it started in September. We are starting a new batch in March in 2024. But what can you expect? Well, you will have more, around 1,000 hours of learning. Then you are going to have uh, several subjects that you are going to master, all the subjects that you need to master in order to go to a company and start working. Okay, so this is for working as a robotics developer. We include something about the theory, also about robotics and so on, but mostly focusing on doing things. So you can start working from the day number one. We based our learning on lessons where you practice with simulated robots, but you also will connect to our remote labs, the ones that we have in Barcelona, like the one that you can see here. This is for beginners. Then we have a warehouse with a robot provided by Robotnik in collaboration with Robotnik and also a uh, universal robot arm. You are going to be programming the robots from your location. We have also the cyber wall in collaboration with Usarion also. And, and then other subjects. Finally, you will do a project in a remote cafeteria that we have built here at our facilities. And at the end, if you pass everything, you can get an internship at one of the companies that are partners in, with this program. Several around the world, in many, many countries around the world, you will have an internship there. And that's it. So from there to the glory, you know, to become a super cool robotics developer. Then uh, that's it. I wanted to tell you about the program. Now let's go with the person that we are going to interview today. I'm going to interview today. Then let me introduce you, Santiago Montiel. Santiago is a PhD student and researcher at University of Alcalá in Spain. And his research is focused on radar perception for autonomous vehicles. And is one, uh, and Santiago is one of the developers of Aibatar, which is an open source autonomous driving stack project. Welcome to the podcast, Santiago. Thank you so much, Ricardo. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I have to tell you that I'm really happy to stay here. Because all in all, the audience has to know that I learned Ross with uh, Ricardo's videos when I was <laughs> first starting. So, so you have to enroll in his programs because then Thank one you. of the <laughs> of the possible output is to become a researcher. Then, but uh, for sure, so I'm really happy to stay here 
moreover because of the of the personal side because I have seen you as a reference on in, on the Rose community so I'm really happy to stay here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's, a, it's an honor. It's my honor to to meet you. And also, we we met uh, physically in person at the Roscon Spain in Madrid some uh, a month ago, something like a month ago. And then you explained me about your interesting research about autonomous driving uh, autonomous driving cars, and also you did a presentation. And that's why I th I thought, wow, that subject is super interesting. You need to tell to the audience of the Rust Developers Podcast. So yeah, yeah, sure, we are sure. two happy people here then. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> thank you so much for the invitation again. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Then uh, let's go, let's go, let's say to the uh, people, so what, uh, what is uh, your, your, your research group in the, at the which do, uh, you are the developing software for autonomous cars? It's called the Robo RoboSafe Research Group. So what is this group and what is its goal? Okay, so we are the RoboSafe Research Group. We try, we aim to develop uh, some autonomous driving stack in an open source manner. And it's all in all, it's based in, in the ROS2 framework right now. We are going from ROS1 to ROS2 right now. But uh, it's a group, it's a research group that has a long trajectory because it was originated in 2006. I mean, there are 17 years of robotics here at the University of Alcala. And we firstly started with two branches of research. I tell we were, but I was not even in the university, but well, the, the, the past is there. And we began with uh, stereo vision systems for ADAS, for assistance systems through autonomous driving. And then we had another research branch, which was about mobile robotics, robotics in, in outdoors, outdoor robotics. And then we saw the opportunity in around 2017, 2018, to go to merge both branches. And with all that hype that you said before in the presentation about, <laughs> about the autonomous driving uh, uh, phenomenon. So we embraced that phenomenon and we are developing autonomous cars since there. So right now we aim to develop a full autonomous driving stack in simulation and then we are specialized in doing some uh, niche vehicles or specialized vehicles in terms of outdoors environment, indoors and outdoors environment in terms of mobile robotics. So I think we come from a long trajectory. We have, we began with Ross in this, this is something that people have told me because I didn't know even Ross. Uh, we have we began with Ross in 2012. We, we also competed in the DARPA Robotics Challenge in 2013. Oh. So yeah, we were one of the first Europeans in that competition. We it was a joint venture with other universities in Madrid, in the community of Madrid. Awesome. So all in all, we have a long trajectory with Ross, and now we have decided to to migrate to Ross two and to develop our st uh, autonomous driving stack there in in Ross two. Okay, but uh, yeah, you, so you are mentioning about this uh, autonomous driving stock. It's yeah. that the, this project that is called Ibatar. Yeah. Okay, and uh, what what is it about? Uh, can can you provide more information to the audience? Okay, so let's let's start with firstly in 2017, what we do is we start with with autonomous driving, and the thing that, that the approach that we took is that we are going to do all ourselves. We want to do an in-house development or for everything from an academic uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we do in 2017 is we buy an open source chassis. I mean, an open source chassis. So the it's, physical part. Yeah, the, the physical chassis. part, the physical. We bought it. It came just the chassis with the, uh, with the steering wheel, the brakes, uh, four seats, and it was everything we had. So okay. we started from there and we started crafting everything from the battery system to the hardware to the drive-by-wire system. And then what we are doing, when we have put all the bases on, we are developing software for it. We are developing a full autonomous driving stack around it. Uh -huh. um, we expect to we aim to reach it in the future. Uh, we don't know when exactly to reach full autonomous driving because that are major words. But we are moving between a level three or level four in the, in the levels of autonomy denomination. Okay, what do those levels mean? So can you explain uh, to the audience? Yeah, for sure. So the Society of Automotive Engineers in the US uh, just created a, a terminology to define how can we classify this level of autonomy? 
So mm -hmm. for example, we go from level zero, which is the most manual part, the, the only manual, to level five, in which we reach full autonomous driving and there is no need for the driver. In a uh, future level five uh, autonomous car, there will not be the necessity of uh, a driver inside the car they, uh -huh. or even a steering wheel because the, the car will be able to drive around all the situations, all the possible By situations. Itself. So between black and white, there are a lot of grays, as we see in Spain. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so for example, what we know is that we have from level zero to level two, is that we have like, we know as ADAS, Autonomous Driving Assistance Systems. Mm -hmm. And these systems, what like they the do is the parking system. Yeah, for sure. For example, this this system, what they do is that they help the driver in the in the in the driving task. So, for example, level one, level zero is no assistance; it's all manual. Like for example, regular cars. Yeah, present. regular cars, but not today cars because today cars are we can Already, say uh, level yeah, one, yeah, level right. two. <laughs> that's okay. Right. Level one, for example, is when we have. At an assistance system that can act over or the steering wheel or over the brake or accelerator, but only one at the same time. Like then the speed control, for example. Yeah, for example, for example, the lane departure assistant doesn't only have to, it. It allows you to not go away from your from your lane, mm -hmm. so it has only to act over the steering wheel, for example, and the ACC, the cruise. The cruise velocity, the adaptive the cruise, cruise velocity, velocity, cruise control. What this does is that this it only regulates the speed, so it just only acts over the the, the brake or the accelerator. So that will so be then, level one. Yeah, that will be level one. Okay. Then we reach level two, when we can combine both systems. Ah, so, for example, imagine that we are in a in a highway, and in order just to to go in an autonomous manner over that highway, we can combine these two things to just keep the distance with the vehicle that is above us, and then just to keep ourselves in the lane. So when we combine both, that is like level two. It is known as level two. Yes. Okay. I have driven one car yeah. with this system the other day just by by chance because I rented one and then it just automatically connected this. And I, suddenly I was feeling like yeah. the steering all the... Yeah, that was an amazing experience. Interesting. And that's really nice because that's the thing that we have right now, nowadays. We is, we in our, in our streets, in our roads, we have level one or even the more modern are level two vehicles in this case. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's what we have reached, at least in terms of what what there is in the streets, in the roads. You mean when you mean we reach, you mean your your you and your team, your research team. No, I mean in the society. In, in the general, society in general. What we have put in production and uh, in what, production. What people as clients as customers can can buy. Uh -huh. Those are level one, level two cars. So Tesla cars are also level two. Yeah, Tesla cars. There is something. There is something really interesting about this. Because, for example, Tesla uh, says that this system is full self-driving. They sell it as FSD. Yeah. And this is, and I don't know where is the line between the, between the marketing and the post and the belief that they have that they can fulfill it in the future. Because I think that they are a really capable company. But right now, this is not full self-driving. Right now, even regulatorily speaking, is level two. And we in the academia we say that it's L two plus 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 because it's doing a lot of things in L two. Uh -huh. But this has it has not reached uh, level three yet. Not even level three. Wow. At least in terms of regulation. Ah. Uh -huh. Because, for example, the jump between level two and level three is that we consider that something is an ADAS, and in an ADAS, the driver has to take full attention over mm -hmm. the over the driving task, and then we go what we call to autonomous driving, level three, four, and five. There are some levels of autonomous driving. And the difference between level three and five are just in the case in how many times has the driver to be in attending to the task. Paying and attention to the, to the, the, the paying to, attention to the to, to the, the wheel. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And for example, speaking about legislation again, uh, there is a recent new here in Spain, it has been the allowed the first L3 car, which is not a Tesla for sure. It's it's a Ford car. And it's the first one that has uh, fulfilled the requirements to be an L3 car, at least here in Spain. Mm -hmm. And you are doing experiments with L3 level? 
Uh, right now, our experiments are a little bit restricted because, uh, for example, we have our autonomous wheel or our custom car, let's say, because we bought the chassis. We bought the chassis. So we have to build to craft the whole exterior of the car. <laughs> yeah. The rooftop is made by some by one student <laughs> and his father. So with the help of so it's a, a, like a custom car. Okay. So we have a lot of we we have a lot of uh, we pay a lot of attention to the car then because it's and in order to make big experiments in the roads, you have to go through an homologation process. Yeah. For example, here in Spain is Dirección General de Tráfico, the GT. Mm -hmm. That is the the the, the one in charge. Yeah. Of... The the this is the the organization that is in charge of regulating driving here in Spain. And in order to be in Spain and do testing in roads or similar, you have to uh, go to them and ask for, for, for very strict permissions mm -hmm. and in a very controlled environment. So here in Spain, we don't have like a like a lot of flexibility to do this testing. Yeah. But at least, but at least we at the university, we have permission to go through our campus. Ah, okay. Because it's a so, it's a closed environment. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. So we go through through our campus and as we have uh, like a business complex near we have a hospital we have other faculties we have enough use cases to test our algorithms and to do some small tests and to test if the things that we have coded in the laboratory are, are good uh -huh. okay okay so you at least have a, a space in which you can do your experiments and yeah. which is uh, like a mini situation of the real of a real environment that would be okay right. yeah i know that in other countries what they do is that they provide some areas and they mark those areas so it's regular area so other cars can go there yeah. and people also they are doing their lives there but it is marked is indicated oh this is a, a special area for example in japan I, I saw this in the united states i think also in china especially they have those areas so the researchers they can go there that's an advantage because it's yeah. making it easier for for researchers to do tax tests and experiments right yeah yeah for example here in germany we have another case and um, where and in we Germany? Have, you say yeah, here in Germany. Yeah, in Europe. We have some cases of researchers that can go over their cities in their respective universities. Ah, okay. And okay. They are moving they are moving car over urban areas mm -hmm. in which way in which they can do the experiment and so on. But all in all, at least we can just uh, go through our campus and in our campus we are not alone then. We are with people, the yes, people that have exactly. to go to the hospital. Yeah, that's cool. that's very cool, yes. We have to hunt for the use case. <laughs> we have to go behind the bus because we want the bus. Ah, um, okay. So, so that's the that, case that you are testing. So you need to yeah. kind of catch we, them and then follow. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And then we, more or less we can simulate with other cars or some people can, can help with that. And sometimes it has been the case in which there was some people passing over there and we asked them, hey, can you help us recording this? And the people is really likely to help you here in Spain. So we are so grateful for that. <laughs> so it's, it's really interesting to make that kind of test. Okay, great. And those are level three tests. Yeah, yeah. We can say that we have level three to level four tests because what we are doing is that there is also like a specific terminology for these use cases, what we know as use cases. For example, a pedestrian crossing through a pedestrian crossing. Or a, or an pedestrian that goes unexpected into a lane. Those are like the terminology or the use cases that are taken into the regulation, the NHTSA, the official uh, regulation. So what we try to do is we try to concatenate those use cases in order to be coping with uh, different complex uh, scenarios, and then we test our, our algorithms with that. So. And then we have to say that, for example, in the terms of simulation, we are we are restricted on that because in the terms of simulation, we aim to do full driving, full automatic, autonomous driving. But then we, we have to when we have to go to reality, we have to do like a tiny adaptation of that. Mm -hmm. For example, in terms of simulation, the main objective or the main focus of the Avatar project is to also compete on the Carla Leaderboard Challenge, which is hosted by the organizers of or the maintainers of Carla Simulator. 
Yeah, what 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 is Carla? So we, we did a I did an interview to the developer, the main developer of uh, Carla Simulator. Yeah, like a couple of years ago. And then, but maybe the audience doesn't know what is Carla Simulator. Okay, for sure. So Carla, Carla is an open source also project which try to do on Unreal Engine Four, which is a like a game development engine. They try to do a hyper realistic simulation on autonomous driving. So in that environment, we can recreate uh, the, these scenarios and they as organization, they host a challenge in which we are really focused on because that's the main, the main way in which we have to, the main way we have to evaluate how our algorithms are performing all in all, because we want to go through a holistic validation, what is called a holistic validation. This term refers that we want to measure the impact that a small module in the stack, for example, the perception layer in the stack, does affect to the high level behavior of the vehicle. Okay. So for example, this can translate into something as easy as if I improve in my detection module, for example, then how does this translate into the number of uh, pedestrians that I'm going through or then <laughs> or the number of uh, rules that I'm not respecting? Or the main, the number of time that I'm reaching the goal correctly. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So, so the number of pedestrians that you go through <laughs> is also, that is bad, right? Yeah, but it's, yeah, that is bad. Okay. That's a penalty. That's a penalty. That's a penalty. We, yeah. We try to minimize penalties. Okay. Okay. Great. So we are on the same page. Just just checking. <laughs> just checking. Okay. So then you have this simulator, Carla, which is based on Unity, and then it's used for it's prepared for doing simulations of autonomous cars. Well, for uh, simulations of cars that then you can use your software and then control those cars in a realistic environment. And this Carla simulator is uh, open source, right? Yeah. And it works with ROS one and ROS two. Yeah. Okay. Just. Clarifying, so because uh, the the members of the audience they sometimes they say, oh, how can I use this in my case? Oh, can, would it be able? So yeah, the the problem of Carla that you explained to me during the Roscon Spain yeah. is that it's free. It's complete. I mean, Carla is free. It's completely free, but it relies. Uh, it's free. It's open source, completely open source, and it's free, but it relies on the Unity engine. Then the Unity engine is not neither open source nor free. Well, it's free for research. If you do research, it's okay. And then if you are doing your personal things, also you can download the Unity engine and use it and no problem. For companies, it's not free. It's not free. So we need to clarify this because different types of audiences in, in, in the, uh, different types of people in, in the audience. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And then we, what we try to do as researcher is to, to inject our, so for the more technical, for the more key people, the Carla has its own ROS bridge. So what it does is that it translate the messages that the simulator is giving us. For example, in this kind of message, I can say the measurements from the sensor mm -hmm. or even how do you act over the actors or the vehicles in the scene, you can inject code. And then with this uh, bridge that is designed for ROS, you can read what Carla is giving you and then you can act over Carla. So all in all, it's perfect because it is simulating the same input and output that we have in our real car. Yes. yes so we, ta we take the measurements from the sensor, we take what is the environment from the sensors, and then we do the whole processing of the stack. And this, with this whole processing, we can then send an, an actuation order, an actuation command to the vehicle and based. then the vehicle moves in that world. Exactly, based on your code, which is in Rust. Yeah. In Rust. So your code in Rust is the one that is deciding, I mean, the localization in here, whatever, and then the steering commands or the brake commands in order to follow a path, right? It's That's the good part about Rust in this project because Rust, what allows us is to do the same exact thing in simulation than in real. Yes, exactly. That's a super yes. advantage. Yeah. That's, that's the perfect uh, solution for us. And then you then you have to cope with real problems or with the simulator problems, but those are minimal. The time of adaptation from from the simulation to the to the real world is just a matter of not about the software itself because that rose is rose is covering them. So the, be, much more between the difference between the simulator and the hardware devices then that the the software is running on. 
Yes. And, uh, but then for that simulator, you had to build your own model of your car, right? Because Carla mm -hmm. comes with some models already made of cars. So if you are doing research with those models, then, okay, so you can go straight. But in your case, you mentioned that you built everything, uh, the physical real robot. So that means that Carla is not, is not, I mean, doesn't come by default. So there is a process to build your model in the simulation, right? Yeah, okay. and there you can go as deep as you want because you can go and you can take like some templates from another vehicle, but Carla gives you the the possibility to do everything about dynamics, even in the car. Mm -hmm. So then we're not really focused on that because then the dynamics are the things that change from the simulator to the real because yeah. dynamics in the real world are really difficult and mm -hmm. Carla developers do an awesome job over there and they're improving, but at, at the end, the real world is difficult itself. So, but we have injected what we call the, like the, the shader of our vehicle and you can see our vehicle over there. Uh -huh. Excellent. Excellent. Then you use the simulator for which purpose? Then, uh, so here is the perfect time to introduce you to our uh, framework of to our framework itself, uh, because depending, it is changed in depending on which module of the, of the autonomous driving stack that we can talk later about. But for example, the, the the framework that we use here is that firstly, we try to isolate the development from ROS in our first stage because we as researchers, we have to experiment a lot. So we try to atomize the problem and to go to have the less noise possible in, in this case, okay? As deterministic first, as possible. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So firstly, that we do is that we take like some kind of database. There are databases for all the the task in the autonomous driving task from perception to prediction to localization to odometry ta odometry task uh, task then to the planning and decision layers i mean there are a lot of databases and there are a lot that for us i like the standard and with that standard what we can do is to compare ourselves with the rest of the of researchers in the world okay and that's nothing related still we have an entry into the simulator yeah. we use just the databases to test your algorithms and yeah, see if we, how it rank, how they rank. For sure, because at least what we do here in research is that we take some like uh, theoretical ideas. For example, right now, Avatar Prey is focused on deep learning, on introducing deep learning into the autonomous driving stack. So what we do is that we take that theoretical ideas and then we propose like some applications of that. So for example, in my case, my thesis is focused on radar and camera fusion for perception. So in my case, I have to take some databases and let's say, mm, the people is doing this, but how can I do some kind of improvement? Can I say, can I mix this in another manner? Or I have to ask myself, how, would, how can I improve this? So then I do that and I test. Then I see against, how- Against, how against I... the same data of the database, right? So you can Correct. see if you have improved or not. Yeah, That's... so what we have to have is like a benchmark or a code kind of a comparison mm -hmm. with the rest of the methods of other researchers. Of other researchers. They okay. propose their thing, we propose ours. It's it looked like kind of competitive, but we love or we love and all our, <laughs> we love us as researchers. We don't have bad uh, things between us. Okay. But it's it's kind of competitive in that sense. But uh, the kind of the way of measuring that is like just comparing in a specific way, in a specific task. For example, detection. Uh, of pedestrians. Yes, so detection of pedestrians compares against other methods of detection of pedestrians. Uh -huh. So once we have gone through that phase, once we have gone through the phase of uh, taking everything and let's say we are happy with our development, then we go to the second stage of our development and we introduce this into the simulator. Okay. This this way of doing things has also learned uh, taught us to code in itself because we have to code a solution that is valid for a database, for a simulator, and then for a real thing. Ah. It's as a, something as a developer that you have to automize, atomize the code, isolate the problems. Uh, doesn't you don't have to put any kind of strange dependency over there that any magic number that then I don't know where this yeah about. then it works only it's perfect this number for the database but then when yeah. you use it in the simulator it completely breaks the the car against a, a, a wall or something right okay okay yeah, yeah but that's that's excellent because that's the process that any 
robotics developer needs to apply when developing. So uh, many roboticists that are there, they just want to test it on the real robot just right now. And that's not, that's not a good idea. I mean, if you have a small robot there, it doesn't matter what happened to it, it's okay. But in, in the real environment, in the, the companies, you need to take care of your robot. So if you do something wrong in your code, then you can break the robot or harm somebody. Even sure. So then that's the process. First, with fake data. Well, it could be real data, actually. It could be taken from a, a car moving around the street, but it's just a fixed Data. Yeah, fixed data, a fixed data, okay. fixed data is what allows us to compare ourselves with the exactly, rest. exactly yeah. because you have the determinism of that data, which is you no. Know. Then second step is on the simulation, and then final step is when you bring to the real one, and your same code has to work in all of them without, yeah. I mean, without uh, any special change. Everything has its modification. It's little yeah. modification. It's small. Yeah, 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 yeah. The full core, the, maybe the 90, 95% of the code must be the same because we aim to have that flexibility in this case. Mm -hmm. Because you have to think, you, you have said, uh, companies have to take care about their cars, about their robots, but we only have one custom car. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that we have built ourselves. Exactly. But that's also what happened to the, uh, the companies. And, yeah. and then uh, the uh, one company that was working before, then we had humanoid robots. And then, so we had one. And then there were so many researchers there. So you cannot break the robot because each one was doing the different parts. So it, when you finish, the other one has to take the robot and it has to be, still be working so that is, is yeah. the same situation excellent yeah for sure for sure for sure and then as you say that's the third part and now the core of the avatar project is focused on that second part because that second part is on the, the simulator it, yeah the simulator because we go into the simulator and our objective as i have said is to compete in that carla leaderboard challenge okay but wait you didn't explain what is the carla leaderboard challenge what is that? okay the Carla Leaderboard Challenge is the competition that is hosted by the maintainers of Carla Simulator. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in that uh, competition, you are put into uh, into some into a different range of situations, and your autonomous agent have to cope with them all. That's why I said before that we are aiming for level five because we don't know what we are going to expect in in Carla Leaderboard Challenge. Okay. We have to cope with as much as situations as possible. Uh -huh. Then live, taking this into real uh, real world, it's much more difficult than we are much restricted to not simple, but restricted uh, use cases. But okay. in this case, in simulation, we are focused with Avatar Project at doing as much points as possible, which means that we have fulfilled the routes successfully without hurting anybody. Okay, excellent. <laughs> and how are you doing on that leaderboard competition? Now the, we have uh, we have gone through the past competition we did. We have won. We got a fourth position over there in the map track because there are two tracks here, which are the which is the sensor track and the map track. Some people, depending on if they use or not use high definition maps, they rank in one challenge over another. We can talk about this right now, but uh, we use map for navigation, high definition map, which if if the audience doesn't know is a very rich representation of the environment. We are not talking about the map that we can see in Google Maps. We're talking about the map that has a definition, a topological definition of how the lanes are connected. Wait, 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 stop, stop. You are introducing okay. there a lot of terms. I know that they look like water to you because you mastered the subject, but for some people of the audience, they don't know what is this. Okay. So, so you, have, you have mentioned maps and high definition maps. Those yeah. are two different things? In autonomous driving, yes. Okay, so because what are the maps? Which are? Maps is the map that we have, for example, in Google Maps that allow us to localize ourselves with respect of the world, for example. Wait, and so you are not talking about the maps that we do in robotics, which is with a LiDAR, or a 3D LiDAR, and then we scan the hole, and then we use a SLAM algorithm. Are you talking about this kind of map? No, no. because SLAM is not really suitable for general purpose autonomous driving okay great 
Slam maps are really good for robotics because the environment in which you are moving is like really controlled and it's limited. Yes, it's small. Yeah. For ex yeah. So, but uh, then imagine that I have to do an Slam map of the whole city of Alcalá de Henares or the whole city <laughs> of Madrid. It's that's really difficult to maintain. And yeah. the the thing that is good about the Slam is going through the same way. Yeah. Uh -huh. To go so far, and I don't know if the audience know the term about the loop closure. It, uh, when the Slam, you go through the same point. Yes. You can like match with the map that you have before and then correct your errors to do like a very good slam map. But that's that's not really useful for autonomous driving. Well, we can imagine, for example, if we go through a through a circular lane of bus. Yes, it, for example. The slam maps will be very suitable. But for an autonomous driving car that has to go along a lot of uh, places or different places, that is very difficult to go through the same place in I don't know, many hours, then slam maps are not suitable. So then, then we have three kinds of maps. So okay. let's, let's, let's recap. We let's recap, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we have talked about the slam maps. Then we have talked uh, about the maps, the normal maps that are the ones that we have in Google Maps that they allow us to localize us, us with respect to the world. Right now I am here in, in Alcalá. You are in Barcelona, for example, no? Yes. And, and then... We have the high definition maps. That okay, is wait, the third. Wait, for the second, for the second one is the one you know where you are because you have the GPS. Correct. Right? So there's those are the maps, the second type of maps, the Google Maps are the ones that you understand where you are because of a GPS signal. Right? And that's the maps that we use from for going from point A to point B. B exactly. So you know your GPS location of the car and then of course, you, you mark wherever you want to go, and then you know how much is still missing or which one are the, la the, the trajectories that you have to follow according to that. Okay, great. And then we go to the HD maps. Correct, the high-definition map. Okay. In this case, the high-definition map is a representation of how the lanes or the roads are built itself or how are they connected. For example, imagine that I'm in a highway. A high-definition map will tell me that I am in the center lane, that I have another lane that I can drive over at my left, another that I have at my right. Maybe there are over there some other lanes which I cannot drive because I'm in the opposite sense of the of the mm. of the driving. In these maps, it's also reflected where the semaphores are, where the stop signals are. The so traffic with, signals. Yeah. All the traffic, the traffic signals. signals and semaphores. So with this map, with the system of these maps, we can do a lot of things about navigation in the roads. We can know from a prior perspective before going to there that we're going to find a stop signal or that we're going to find a semaphore, for example, a traffic light, sorry. But for example, this has to be combined with other measurements. But well, there is a big debate on how do we drive with HD maps or without H or without HD maps. We don't negotiate about the map, the normal map, <laughs> this is mandatory. <laughs> this is yeah. this one is mandatory. Yeah. But for example, people are debating about the using of HD maps or the not usage of these ones. I understand. Some people, I presume, I don't know about this fight, but I presume that the the ones that doesn't want the HD map are the the ones that do prefer to have like a really autonomous system that has to react in front of whatever it perceives, right? Like us. Like like humans, right? If I go to Alcalá de Henares, for example, driving, so I have to be able to manage without loading into my mind how Alcalá is organized, right? I yeah, presume yeah. I presume that this is one, but the other one is more practical in the sense that uh, could you be in this line? Yeah, and right now there is a debate in that you will need to make full autonomous driving possible. You will need an edge definition map of the whole world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. of the earth of the planet earth should be mapped in a high definition maps all the roads would be over there and that's something that nowadays is not possible technically talking and what is your position right now our my position my personal position is if you have it use it because if you have it use it why because as much information as you have the better decisions you are going to take uh, it's a very clever point yeah, very because, for example, uh, there's, there is another related debate, which is which sensor do I use? 
I, I am the I'm from those guys that says that as much possible as much information as possible better because we can have a better understanding we can have a better tracking of what is happening a better better tracking in terms of spatially and temporally I know what is happening around me and I know better what has happened before mm-hmm. or, how things are or, evolving yeah how things are evolving and then that will be safer for us and one thing that if we want to make uh, autonomous driving possible we have to make it safe yes that's right but then what are the 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 people that are against those uh, censoring putting more sensors in the in the car what what are the what are their arguments about that i think that there is not an argument about it is better. It's an argument that it's not possible, or even another thing that is, it is not possible to put in mass production. Uh-huh. Okay. So, for example, imagine the case of can we talk here about brands, right? Yeah, sure, of course. You can okay. talk about anything. Okay. So, for example, imagine the 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 case of of Tesla. In this case, there was a big uh, controversial because uh, they decided to remove radar from their sensor suit. And they decided to rely only on cameras for the perception suite. The mm-hmm. perception, for those who don't understand, is the way that the vehicle is going to understand the environment and what is happening around it. So they decided to throw, to throw away one sensor that, is, that was radar, and that's a sensor that is mounted physically in the cars that people have bought. So it is not being used right now. And why? Why this is happening? Why this is happening? Because... Tesla is a company and a company has to make money itself, right? To survive. Yes. Then they have to do the best thing they can do with the things they have included today. Uh-huh. So for example, Tesla put into production, into mass production, a bunch of cars that were equipped with one radar or more radar. I don't know if, if it is exactly one, but they don't use it. They don't use them. And a bunch of cameras. I think that's eight cameras. They have to do the better perception and the better autonomous driving they can with that because their their cars are on the street. Mm-hmm. We in the academia, we can do things. We can do a lot of things. We can imagine what is the better combination still because we don't have the purpose or the need to make money. Yes. We, research has to be founded in that case. And doesn't need that pressure to do something that has to go into mass production right now. Right I now. am telling uh, you that research has to be useful, so it has to go into mass production in a short future, somewhere, as short as possible. Somewhere, yeah. As short as possible, but we don't have that pressure to do something that right now has to be profitable in this case, mm. in this sense of case. Okay. So Tesla is really interest is really, really, I don't know how to say really smart with their their with their approach because they are doing the the best they can with the with the things they have mm-hmm. and they do it really well okay they do it really well but for example there is they they saw that the radar in this case they were mounting an industrial radar from 2012 or something like that so they they thought that the radar was not giving enough useful information to their sensor suit to even include it they could do everything with only cameras. Wow. Tesla would love to include another radar, for example, or a better radar, but they have like thousands and thousands of cars without that already, radar. That they want. Already on the street, right? Yeah. Without all they, radar. Oh. They can modify their software because their cars are connected, but they cannot modify the hardware they sold to their customers. I see. I see. And that's a great difference. Ah, I see. And uh, but then you you are talking about those sensors that are equipped in in the car. So, which ones are the sensors that typically are used in uh, autonomous driving? Okay, so typically we come from from the ADAS part, and in the ADAS part we are using typically cameras and radars, what we are going to call conventional radars. Mm. Okay, and then Ch- the but which are used for what? The radars. What? The radars are used for what? 
In this case, radars are used for the ACC use cases in which you try to maintain the distance with the vehicle that is in front in of front. you because radar is able to measure the velocity of the reflections. Okay. So radar does not only give to me the position of the objects that are around me, but also give me the velocity. So it is very suitable to estimate the speed of that vehicle and then maintain the distance mm -hmm. to adapt my velocity to their velocity because I can measure it. So that's the main difference, for example, between radar and lidar. Uh -huh. Yes, exactly, because the lidar only tells you where is the yes, the yes. it's not okay. telling me where. Great. And in this case, uh, cameras are the cameras as we know in the in the mainstream. They are like cameras that are made for industrial purposes, but they give you the appearance and how the street looks. And that's are the two sensors that are mounted. Nowadays, in the street cars, in the, in the cars that we have right now in the streets. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but Academia has been a little bit obsessed with LiDAR. Why? Because LiDAR is a sensor that gives you a lot of resolution, a lot of spatial resolution about what is happening about you. I think that in this, LiDAR can be one of the main components of mine, one of the main sensors of the future, not only in autonomous driving. Is it? Don't you think that uh, vision algorithms will evolve to such a uh, su such a degree where they will be able to capture distances to objects in the same way as we do it? So yeah, for we sure. can get rid of the later for that. Yeah, we will be able to to do as good as we do with lidar, because for all those who don't know, the in the academic benchmark. Mm. The, uh, normally, the algorithms that have better performance are, the, are those based on LiDAR. Mm -hmm. LiDAR is giving us a very realistic representation of the environment in the form of a point cloud. Yeah. That a point cloud is a lot of points that reflect over the objects. And then with the reflection of the object, we can see the shape, yes. where they are, how big they are. And for example, camera has a lot of difficulties to get the distance yes yeah and lidar gives you that yeah camera will evolve and camera will will get to the point of lidar but lidar has a great point and it's about something about legislation again because with lidar you can have as much information as possible but you don't have semantic information what does this mean yeah. that we don't know the physical appearance of people and this goes really well with the lights of the, the loss of protection of data. Ah. So this will be very suitable, for example, for infrastructures. Ah, and all of that. Not only in autonomous driving. Oh. So never thought about that. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Going back going back to AD then. Yes. <laughs> going back to AD then. Right now we have in, in autonomous driving, we have cameras, we have this LiDAR that gives you a really good representation of the environment. And then we have radar mm -hmm. in both versions, the convert the conventional one, and we have new generation radars. And new generation radars are radars that are better in this uh, taking this spatial resolution, but giving better representation of the space. Because the strong point of radar was velocity. But we didn't know where things exactly were, so it was really restricted. And right now we have better radars that are going now to the market right now. And we there is a lot of research on doing better radars. And I think that radars can be something that is really suitable for the future of autonomous driving. And that's why I have focused my thesis here, uh -huh. because for example, you're betting. Yeah, I'm betting for that. I'm okay. betting for that, and I'm betting that. For example, the main purpose of my thesis is that I am betting that I can get a, a performance, a, per, a perception performance that is similar to the LiDAR one, only with radar and camera. Oh, I see that's you. my research question in this okay, case. Okay, okay. So that exactly. So that's what you mentioned at the beginning of this interview yeah. that you were researching, but we didn't understand no, uh, what you were talking about now. Uh, uh, 49 minutes of the interview, we now got it. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> exactly, that's a perfect, that's a perfect. Okay, so that's why you are um, doing the, uh, focusing your research into the 
the fusion between cameras and radar. So yeah. you can have a, a similar perception or even better than having a LiDAR. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Great. Excellent. And then with this art, with this that are the algorithms that I'm trying that I'm trying to to go through because I'm just starting my PhD. So then we go back to the Carla simulation and the Carla challenge that was open just yet. I, I haven't forgotten about that because <laughs> that are like our flagship in this in this laboratory. And what we do in the in Carla simulator is to introduce all the results of our research and then we try to fulfill and to get the maximum score as possible and we had a a, a fourth uh, position in the map track of the Carla leaderboard 2021 and then all that code that has been released publicly so you can go to to the Carla challenge then Carla challenge evolved to a version 2.0 Carla Leaderboard Challenge evolved to version 2.0. And this year we are adapting to this new Leaderboard 2.0. So we are not going to be able to participate this year. But our two main goal is, uh, is to put all the focus on this challenge as a research group in the Avatar project. And then I suppose that participate in that Carla Leaderboard 2024. And finally open source that code. We okay. will open source it after the competition. Mm -hmm. And then uh, everybody will be able to run our our simul our autonomous driving stack at least at least in simulation. Okay, but then what happened with the real robot? So have yeah. you parked there at the university? No. And is, no. Okay. No. At, at the same time, at the same time, we have the Avatar project, and at the same time, we have another project in parallel, and we are doing like proof of concept with this. Uh, with this uh, real car in this case. So right now what we have as objective is to do a, a demonstration of our capabilities with these complex use cases. And our, our real vehicle is also focused on the aging drivers in this case. So we try to do this autonomous navigation, focusing on the, on the aging drivers. And how do we help these aging drivers? We are also working on on the transition between manual and autonomous mode in this case, how the driver has to react, how do we track the behavior of the driver to tell the driver that he's not paying enough attention to the road and all that. We're also working on, on the human machine interface. In this case, we are we are crazy with the advent of LLMs and chat GPT and all that because we can create a specialized agents to just know the state of the robot in ROS, our our car in ROS, and then tell the tell the driver about the situation and, and all the stuff. So we're working on we are working on that on the real part. And this demo is supposed to happen in summer 2024. So we are working in both ways at the same time. Mm -hmm. We are a small group of researchers, but this is really fun. Robotics is really fun in this yes. case. So we are highly motivated to to accomplish these two goals that are our our big two goals in, in the um, shortest future. Okay, but then if I have understood correctly, so you have developed uh, a, an autonomous driving software, right? That yeah. runs into your car, the one that you have. And yeah. is this software, for, uh, my two questions is, first, is this software available for people to download and check it out and so on? And then the second is up to which point can this software work? So what is the current status? Because I know that you are not a company, you are a researcher, uh, you are doing research, so those things, they uh, when we develop in research, so <laughs> things are get a little bit messy, not that, yeah, yeah. that uh, well updated or documented or so on. So what is the current status of that software if people so want to download it and use it? In terms of uh, in terms of the whole uh, of the whole system, we have the version that we released and it's uh, made to be running Carla Simulator for this mm -hmm. case. But they can go to our GitHub, Robesafe slash UAH for University of Alcalá. Okay. They can download it and test it, and then we also open source all the results of our research stuff because we, as research group, we publish our results in scientific journals, scientific conference. And we use to open source all, all the code that we develop. So this code, depending on the maturity or the readiness of the of the project, 
it is available to run in ROS, it is available to run or in the respective database. Okay, so the, the people of the audience, they can download your software, then install Carla, and then test that software in the Carla simulator. And yeah. reproduce the results of which which year? Twenty two. Twenty twenty one. Twenty one. Okay, twenty one. Okay, I will put a link on the show notes so to, that links to that repo. Mm -hmm. That I will ask you the link later. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> okay, and then, um, but it, then do you know about the AutoWare software, right? That runs very famous. Is the AutoWare for those who doesn't know the AutoWare is an open source autonomous driving software that is developed in Japan, and and then allows you to drive a, a car, and then so can can you tell us the differences between the software that you are developing and the, the one of AutoWare, and why did you decide to to start yourselves? Okay, Something so, similar? so perfect, perfect. So going back to the one of the first questions that I answered, we started this project in 2017 or 2018. Uh -huh. It was a okay. project in, in which software was not even... Yeah, yeah that's the I, answer. The answer. There were some first versions, but the document the documentation was only in Japanese from in that year. So it was not really mature in that way. Yes, in that way. it was very... So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and we follow, we really follow the work of AutoWare and we had the chance to to change or even to 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 see what they're doing to learn from them because i think that their that their their project is really interesting in this case they are doing they are doing lots of things they have a complete stack they have the at, at least what i have seen is the whole stack and it's an open source project in this case as as us uh, we didn't adopt AutoWare because we needed something that fit for our purposes. And in this case, as we want to go as deeper as possible in the system, we want to go. We have to have the complete know-how or the complete knowledge I about see. how the system works. In this case, we can even uh, enter into mixed approaches in which maybe sometimes we can borrow a model from AutoWare uh, to to fulfill any of the of the parts of the of the stack. But we decided to go in our own journey because we needed to have the full control of everything in this case. And we think that they are doing things that are really good. And I like how they approach them. But in this case, we decided to go by our own. Yeah, we, are not aim yeah, we are not aiming to compete with them in this case. So, I mean, they, we have like, we love what they do. But it was not our our path in this sense. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. And it's super cool that we have some other alternatives and approaches, open source alternatives and approaches to autonomous driving. Not just that one, because actually I think that that's the only one that exists in in the Ross world. In the and Ross I would say, and I would say even in even outside the Ross world, there is no autonomous driving open source code in the there world, is... right? There is, there is there is a couple of alternatives. They are not on the on the on the Ross ecosystem. But the problem that we have with AV is that sometime in some at some point we have to reach the hardware. And to build a, a car, an autonomous car at home is not as easy as building a robot yep. in this case, or are buying some plat robotic platform in this case. So the really differences start the real differences start when you have to when you touch the real world let's say no yes. the, when you touch the real hardware the physical devices and in that case for example you have problems when you try to adapt auto wear to your suite of sensors you will have problems trying to add our solution to your stack of sensors i mean autonomous driving is is really complicated in that sense yeah it's true for example there are other open source alternatives that needs from an specific middleware or something that is like a big uh, big obstacle in the in the in the way of implementing or adopting a, a, a an open source solution okay and then you you i think that you nail it which is the touch with reality when you go yeah. to the hardware that's the difficult part then i would like to take the chance now that because you you build your own car so that's yeah. that's a lot of effort that's a lot of energy of money and and then of time also then i would like to take the chance to recommend 
our friends of Robotnik, which is a company that is in, based in Valencia. Yeah. And then they build robots and they sell robots. It's their, their business. They are super nice guys. They are experts in, in the world building raw space robots. And then they, they sell a car, an electric car, which is already ready. It's a, the RB car, which you can buy and start uh, applying um, then algorithms just off the shelf without having to pay attention to, to building the car if you want. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Maybe it's a good starting point for a relationship between Robotnik and the University of Alcalá. Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. And then, I mean, we know we are aware of the work of Robotnik, but as we say, we it, it was the same case as software. We built it before in our, our yes, home. Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> but but I, I mean, as you say, it's... Every point is a good point to start any new relationship in yes, this case. Exactly. And for the audience, if the audience yeah. wants to use your algorithms and they don't want to dedicate the time to build the car, they can just go. And uh, I will put a link also to Robotnik because Robotniks are very cool guys and then we support them, their job. Very good. Then let me see if I have... Uh, if I have missed any question, because we jump from one place to another, but at, yeah. at the end, I think that everything was covered in a round manner. And yeah. want to, I don't know if uh, you remember, because um, we have talked about the sensors and also... Uh, oh, one question uh, that is here is about the algorithms that you develop. So you have mentioned about algorithms for perception, you have mentioned about the sensors that are used in the in the car, but what about the path planning algorithms and control algorithms? Are you developing also your own algorithms for that? Yeah, in, in this case, we have made some works about that. Uh, as as uh, I'm not really focused on that topic, but I will try my best to explain the the concept from my from my lab mates. So we have built our own uh, control algorithms. In this case, uh, let's say, let's talk about a bit of planning. We can distinguish about what is global planning, uh, route planning and trajectory planning. And let's say, depending on the level, the planning is usually divided from higher level behavior, like go from point A to point B, to a lower, a middle behavior, in this case, go through a lane or make an obstacle of uh, obstacle avoidance, avoidance. maneuver. And then we have the lowest level in which we uh, transform these uh, higher level behaviors into some electrical variables or physical variables that we send to the robot to, to act. In this case, we have developed some low level uh, control algorithms in this case for, for planning. And we are really focused on right now on doing that part of uh, the middle behaviors, let's say. Because, for example, for the higher part, we rely on known techniques such as a star. Because when you have an HD map, you can apply a star or certain algorithms or traditional algorithms to know from go from point A to point B. But then, let's say that in the middle, we have that part. It's what I have to do right now. I have to go in front to in. I have to keep my lane. I have to do an uh, an, an, an ACC or yeah or an, or an avoidance maneuver, and that's where we are applying uh, from classical techniques such as uh, POM DPs uh, that te most technical people will know to reinforcement learning. And in this case, we are really focused on reinforcement learning for this kind of middle behavior. And you train those uh, reinforcement algorithms in the simulator. Yeah, for sure. In this case, we we switch between simulators because reinforcement learning is based on the iterations of some situations, some known situations. And for example, we found that performing simulations in Carla was like really computationally expensive in this case. So we went to lower resolution or lower level uh, simulators. In this case, we found Sumo, for example, Sumo, like the like the Japanese combat technique. In this okay, case, that's the name of a simulator. Yeah. Okay. Sumo. I don't know this one. And this one is like some kind of drawings, and it simulates the traffic flow. Ah, so, for example, okay. for, for example, what we discovered is that going firstly into this Sumo and then going to Carla, then we have like that transfer of knowledge. 
yes. between both things and between both uh, between both environments. And then we made we made a lot of focus on on that part on planning. And we have some words that deal with the with dealing with intersections and all that stuff based on reinforcement learning. Okay, that's that's clever. Yeah, because you are seeding the final result. First, you train on the Sumo, which is a simplified version. Yeah. Then with those results, you go to Carla and continue training, right? Yeah, because we speed up the first part the of first the training. Part. Because, for example, in Carla, we will need, like, imagine that Carla goes one-to-one -one with the world. In this case, we will need to make, like, the same time we deal with an intersection in real life in Carla, because it's one-to-one, -one, more or less, yes, a hyper-realistic simulator. But this kind of drawing simulator that draws the traffic flow and all that stuff, we can make like lots of iteration faster because we don't need to render that world in GPU. And we discovered that sitting firstly on these simple simulators, then we could go into Carla. And, and speed up this process. Yeah, okay. speed up the process of training because reinforcement learning, uh, one of the big weaknesses is that it has a very long period of training. Mm -hmm. It's not like, for example, deep learning for vision, for example, in convolution, convolutional neural networks. We reach, let's say, the knowledge much faster than we make in, in reinforcement learning in this case. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, excellent. Then um, uh, one final question I would like to ask you is because you mentioned that your code is running at present in ROS1, but you are doing a transition into ROS2. Yeah. Right? And then, so how is this experience been so far? Well, depending on <laughs> depending on the point of view, because for example, um, we are migrating in, from ROS one to ROS two in the context that let's say, let's say a thing first in university or in academia, there is like a very short, like I call period of rotation, because people enter when it's doing its bachelor's thesis or its master's thesis and goes out when. It is the final of their PhD or the final of their thesis. So mm -hmm. people just stay here for two, three, four years, in, for example. So we went, so at the laboratory, we are living like in the, in going from one generation to another generation. From people that is going out to, to academia and to industry and people that is coming new. Yeah. So uh, we also take this point um, some of the people is just learning ROS2 from the very beginning. In my case, I'm one of those people that is in the middle between the both generations. So I have gone through the process in ROS1 and in the process right now in ROS2. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> depending on how you code it on ROS1, it's going to be in ROS2. Because, for example, I was really used to uh, make uh, like object-oriented programming in ROS1. You, don't, you didn't need to do objects for nodes or just for and that mindset was for me was taken but for some people it's really it's really different and we are dealing with some problems that are taking us back again to learn again to the fundamentals the of fundamental. yes. yeah 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 but we have seen that uh, talking about scalability for example and uh, talking about for latencies and talking about for the communication of data between the nodes, for example, ROS2 has made a big improvement. For example, we that we are Python lovers, we love launch files in Python. <laughs> Aha, okay, okay. So you are the, those. Yeah, okay. those guys that you code in those. Python. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's talk by my side because we are we are I, I I'm working on perception. So perception is really tied to deep learning, and deep learning is tied to, to Python. Python in this case. But but we are living a, a nice time because we both the versions are colliding because some parts are still in ROS1, some parts are ported into ROS2. Now, as I presented in Roscon Spain, we are redoing our whole perception uh, layer from zero just in ROS2. So it's been an, an amazing, an amazing experience. And we know that, for example, in academia, it's been a little bit traumatic because uh, there is not as much as workforce as possible and some some people in academia is having some trouble migrating big things as i say because two things the short period of time in which people spend here mm -hmm. 
for example, you have nodes that was in which people was involved that is not here yet. That there is no maintainer of that package, for example. And there is people that has to learn Rust 2 from scratch. So we are facing mainly with those those two difficulties. But I think we will have it. Uh, our objective for sure is to accomplish our shortest uh, goals in Rust 2. So we have to finish our migration as soon as possible. Uh, I can say that we have like an 80, 90 percent of our new perception stack that wow. we will uh, release. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're almost there. That we will release in after Carla Leaderboard twenty twenty four. It's a perception stack that includes detection, tracking of the objects, association, prediction stage. It's a very complete stack, wow. and we will try to release it after the the Carla challenge. And and that's all because of that on on that side because, I mean, it's been. It's been a rough time learning and co-living with both systems. And I, and I, and I tell you, as, as kind of an insight, uh, some people in academia is having trouble migrating because they have codes that are legacy codes. Uh, they were working in their own box, in their little box, and now takes one people and dedicate exclusively to port that. It's been a, a little bit traumatic. Yes, but that's because they are not learning Ross too at uh, the construct. Yeah, for sure. So for sure. yes, they, <laughs> so people there out there, don't waste your time searching for free resources online. Go to the construct and just hustle free and very fast. That's where yeah. you, how you have to learn about Ross too. That's the yeah, way. Yeah. <laughs> and one one last question or one last topic that I would like to talk with you is yes. about the the relationship that we have between industry and academia in this case. Ah. Okay, yeah. So in this case, for example, our group has had a lot of tradition of working in projects that involve both industrial partners and academic partners. So in that case, uh, we are not only working on our uh, research staff and our research projects. We we make, uh, the, at the same time, we are making projects and we have worked with, 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 with partners in the, in the ADAS industry, for example. Uh, from before and we are really open that if somebody wants uh, some help or some aid they can reach us for example and uh, we are nice people then so we can we can do really we are nice people and we are passionate about what we are doing that is really important i think and we love doing cars and we do we do love doing robots with drawers then so okay, i hope so that then so Anybody you, feel free to contact to you. reach us. Yeah, yeah not okay. only not only companies, also students, also people that has gone through the through the construct courses and they want to explore their opportunities in the market. We, no. They are they are really welcome. Then okay, excellent because you you have uh, places for people uh, first for delivering. Uh, so if I have understood correctly, so you can uh, you can deliver you can finish projects of companies that require this expertise that so yeah, you can sure. do those projects right that's what you are mentioning right now yeah, for sure. if i have understood this is one thing and then the second thing is that uh, also you have open positions for other people that come to your university and do research there yeah for sure in this case uh, maybe bachelor's or master's thesis are restricted to people at alcala uh -huh. because but then we are open to, to any projects and for new students because one of our duties as research group is to to make new PhD and new doctors, such as my case, for example. Ah. Okay, but then they have to know ROS2. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> ROS2 as the, at the construct. At the construct, <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Excellent, excellent. Then uh, I think that we are going to finish here. I think we have close very good this episode and then just reminds to tell you thank you very much for sharing all this knowledge and all those interesting stories that you have shared with us and see you around the world i hope to see you as soon as possible ricardo is it possible in a present in a presidential event or something like that yes. i would like to do some I, I hope that one day there will be a, a rose meetup at, here at madrid as we are going to do in barcelona Ah and yes, so we are days. yeah. So in two weeks we are doing a Ross meetup in Barcelona. I hope yeah. we can do the same. You can thing at Madrid. you can come you can come and attend if you want to take the train or 
whatever. Yeah, maybe. It's, inv it's invited to every, anybody, so no. Uh, maybe I hope that one day we have those things here in, in Alcalá. In Alcalá, so yes. We're, we're open to, to, to do this kind of events because, for example, I one, one personal reflection or one personal thought that I want to communicate is that Roscon Madrid was a, a big event, a funny event, and it showed us that we have a really powerful community in, in Ross here in Spain. So I I invite everyone to go to the to Roscon Sevilla 2024 next year. Next year. And I hope I can see you there. Yes, we'll definitely see you see us there and yeah. meet all the friends of the Ross Spain community. And Spain, I mean it's not Spain only, it's uh, for Spanish language, let's say. Yeah, for so sure, for sure. any anybody if you some people flaw from uh, another other countries from uh, South America and so on. So anybody is invited to those Roscon Spain. Yeah. Even yes, everyone. <laughs> everyone. <laughs> I was going to make a joke, but maybe, maybe just to stop myself. <laughs> I don't want to. to okay. Be okay. So see you <laughs> definitely. See you on the at the Roscon Spain twenty four, and definitely. otherwise maybe sooner somewhere around the world. Perfect. Thank I you very much, see. Santiago. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Okay, and that is all for today. So remember that if you have uh, um, like if you like this episode, then please give us five stars on any platform that you are listening. Especially if you are in Spotify, it's very cool because it's super easy. You just put it there, five stars. You say these guys are awesome. I like it very much. If you didn't like it, send me a message and tell me why. Okay, don't tell me about the music because I most of people likes it very much okay some other people doesn't but it's okay so that's going to stay but about apart from that you can tell us anything so we can improve then yes so see you next week with a new lesson from the experts and until then keep pushing your Ross learning <laughs>